Welcome back to part two of Peter Knights, founder and CEO of Wild Aid. We'll be taking a closer look at the celebrities who work tirelessly with Peter and the organization and how their efforts are saving precious lives and paving the way towards long-lasting change in the fight for animal advocacy. I know you have some incredible relationships. How did that come about? Prince William has done some PSAs with us, David Beckham. That was um, actually his idea. I gave a presentation. He said, well, do you think it would be a good idea if I got David Beckham on board? I'm like, yeah, that sounds (laughs) interesting because a lot of people all around the world like David Beckham. Um, And then working with Yao Ming um, so that it wasn't, you know, just Westerners talking to Chinese people. It was like, we're all together in this. We all want to save the rhinos. And that's the essential thing is to not go in and point the finger, but to say, look, we all want to solve this problem together. Imagine if all the people in the world could fit into one stadium. Sadly, all the wild rhinos in the world can, with room to spare. For some species, it's almost too late. Well, we could fill this stadium and many more if we can stop the illegal trade. Ask your friends and family never to buy rhino horn. And together, we can save our wild rhinos. And when we did that ad, that was actually um, set in Wembley Stadium. When Prince William went to China, that was shown all over Chinese television like 80 times that day on the main TV network. And he actually had a very good meeting with um, President Xi about wildlife. And, you know, China now is, is really quite passionate and strong about wildlife crime. And do you know what a group of rhino is called? A crash of rhinos. This is a black rhino, and you can tell partly because of the body shape, but also the lips are like a V shape, as opposed to a flat shape, which is the the white rhino. So when you go into an area, do you work with the government first? Absolutely. You have to go in and say to the government, look, you know, we'd like to come and help. Usually we're welcomed in with open arms. Do you have this amazing team of people? It's a very small team. Very often, it really is that decision maker that it's very hard to bring a bottom up idea very often. And so that is why I have to travel quite a lot. It's very often to try and get those key meetings to kind of open the door. And if you can get the key decision maker on board going like, yes, I like this, then you can work with everyone underneath to make it happen. We're still losing our rhinos to ruthless poachers who kill these beautiful animals just because people want their horns. Have you ever felt like your life is in danger doing some of this work? Have you ever been threatened? I have been threatened. um, And our staff have been threatened in Thailand. We had to have a police officer at one point in our office from the Sharpfin traders. So I used to do uh, undercover investigations, and obviously that was a bit more dangerous than doing the public awareness work. But I think nothing compared to people like the Rangers. Those are the guys that are the brave guys. Those are the people that really do put their lives on the line all the time. And that's, again, where, you know, they need our support both in promoting and cheering them on um, and helping to supply them with equipment. But also a lot of them, when I've met them, have like, you know, thank God you're trying to do something about the demand because that's the long-term solution for them. They're in a war and the ultimate solution to the war is to cut off the financing of the other side of the war. When you did your undercover investigations, was that all for wildlife? Yes. So we did stuff on um, bear farms in China. We did stuff on rhino horn, um, bear gallbladders, um, parrots. The first thing I really worked on was wild birds in the pet trade. So parrots and other birds being shipped to the United States and Europe as pets. And about 50% would die on the way. Right. And some of them were becoming endangered, the species who were becoming endangered. So we did we did a whole load of undercover stuff on that with fake business cards and very badly hidden cameras and pretending to be traders and asking, well, how do you do this? Well, if we want to get this, how do we do that? Oh, we get these fake permits. And this guy writes these fake permits. And I actually filmed somebody, the minister in one country, doing this fake permit, explaining to us how he would falsify the permits to us. And then I ran into him like three weeks later at a conference. He wasn't very happy with me, but... My organization has a lot of parrots. We did a um, huge animal neglect case and Mm -hmm. took in 400 animals Mm -hmm. and 80 of them were parrots. Well, I mean, they survive for like 60 or 70 years. And so people buy them and go, oh, yeah, this will be great for four years. Yeah. And then they discover how noisy they are. I think where we really get in trouble is where one part of an animal becomes very valuable and and the incentive is not to take the whole animal and process the whole animal, but just a piece of it. So that's very destructive. It provides this incentive, you know, to go after the very last one, you know, because the price is so high. And so it is like the horn of rhinoceros at one point was supposed to be $60,000 a kilo. Um, or elephant ivory. Pangolins are used for their scales and their meat. And I mean, the size of the animal is less meat than a chicken, probably. Um, but, you know, people are still killing them for both of those things. And they're one of the most sought-after 
animals in the world right now, correct? The pangolin is the most trafficked mammal in the world right the most now. Trafficked. And just a study came out two or three days ago estimating in Nigeria alone like 100,000 pangolins being traded every year. And this is a very ancient animal that has survived because once again, it didn't really have any predators. It, they roll into a ball with their, their shell kind of thing, their, their um, scales, and even a lion can't get them. But then human beings come up when they roll into balls, say, thank you very much, that's very convenient, stick you in a bag and off you go. And so, you know, it's, it's where we ruin the equation of the balance of nature. And very quickly, when you have an international trade, you know, where... You know, locally, if things become sort of rarer, then people turn to something else. But when it's an international trade and a demand, they'll go for the very last one. Never buy penguin meat or skills. When the buying stop, the cooling can too. And let's talk a little bit about COVID. I know there are, um, you know, so many theories on where COVID came from. Right. Wet markets is truly one of them. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of confusion because when people say the lab theory, people think that means it was made in a lab. I think that's been completely discounted. It's not a man-made virus, you know, it's a natural virus. Now, there was a lab in Wuhan that was studying bat viruses, and I think they've traced it back now to a horseshoe bat as the original host. So there is a risk that it might have leaked from the Wuhan lab from a bat virus. Generally speaking, because obviously they have biosecurity measures around that, the other way it could have been transmitted is through animals. And that's happened a bunch of times with other things. So particularly SARS. Now, SARS was civet cats in exactly these markets. Um, and it came, went from bat to civet cat to human beings. This is a known transmission mechanism. Pangolins, for example, they found COVID viruses in pangolins, not COVID-19, but other COVID viruses. So we know these animals can be transmitters. And then you consider the conditions in the wildlife markets are exactly, if you're laboratory designing how to make disease jump, you, you do it the way they do at the wildlife trade. Right. So you bring together lots of different animals that never come into close contact normally, predators and prey, nocturnal and diurnal animals, you stress the hell out of them. You know, I mean, pangolins are solitary animals. They do not like being, even just groups of pangolins freaks them out. Um, you don't feed them properly. You don't give them water properly. They're pooping on each other. Uh, you know, they become sick in the wildlife trade. And they, some people have documented in Vietnam, the animals in the farm were like 5% infected. By the time they reached the market, gone through the transport process, it was up to 55%. So what is basically latent diseases come out and in Nigeria, you know, I talked to them about COVID, but they say, well, we've got Lassa fever, we've got monkeypox, we've had Ebola. These are all related to wildlife trade as well. You know, this is the most likely source of a new pandemic is through wildlife trade. What do you say to people who say, okay, now we've got these poachers. So what will the poachers do now if you put them out of business? In many cases, poaching is putting itself out of business, you know. So if you're, if you're poaching the rhinos, once they're gone, you're out of business anyway. So it's not a sustainable business. But there are people, in, and there's two types of poachers. There's sort of commercial poachers who are kind of hardened criminals, frankly. And then there's local people who are just doing it to subsist. And you have to try and find alternatives. And whether those alternatives are getting involved in the tourism industry. So, you know, if you look, for example, at an elephant. So one person poaches an elephant. They maybe get $500, maybe $1,000, the poacher, and it's done. And they've calculated in Kenya, for example, that elephant during its lifetime is worth a million dollars to the economy and employs taxi drivers, hotel workers, people at the lodges, guides. Uh, more and more local people are getting in to produce food for the tourism industry. So, you know, one of the obvious things to do is to have villages around national parks growing organic food for the lodges to get feed the tourists at a premium price kind of thing. So you have to try and develop those alternatives. These, these chickens, which is a, a hybrid chicken, which is half European chicken, half African chicken. So it has the disease resistance of the African chicken, but the meat of the Western chicken. Okay. And then getting those reared in villages, it's, so it's organic free range chicken, very low carbon input, much more flavor. And so finding those sustainable incomes, those sustainable alternatives is also a major part of the equation. What's your next big thing? Well, the big thing you can help by our choices, um, our, our consumption of whatever it is, whether it's the vehicle you use or public transport, whether it's you know how long you stay in the shower, how much water you use, um, you know whether it's uh, about what you eat. You know, can you eat local produce? Saves a lot. Can you eat less meat? You know, not necessarily saying become vegan, but it, meat is very, very resource intensive. Anything we can do to lessen our meat consumption is going to help climate change. But it's also going to help wildlife because a lot of the rainforest destruction, for example, is for beef production. Just thinking about what you do every day can help reduce your impact. 
Did you grow up with pets? <laughs> um, yes, I've always had pets. And I actually have kept um, freshwater tropical fish for quite a long time. That teaches you about environment because if you get the lighting wrong, it goes all green. If you have too many fish in, it goes green. And it's like a little mini ecosystem. Um, but right now we have, we have two chickens, we have two cats, you two do. dogs, and about 40 fish. You do. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's a bit of a menagerie. So you were passionate about trying to change these things, mm -hmm. but it's so fast, it's so much. You know, that is part of Wilde's philosophies. Don't try and do everything. Try and find some very specific things, very targeted, very focused, very strategic, and make a big success of that rather than trying to spread yourself so thin and right. not really have any impact at all. Oh, we've got this campaign and that campaign. It's like, just do one campaign and really focus and really make an impact and really change it. Yeah. But definitely overall, we're making huge progress in the right direction. To learn more about Wild Aid, go to wildaid.org. And to learn more about Aliqua, go to aliqua.org.